So imagine that you're making a track and it sounds good in the studio, it sounds great in your headphones, but the moment you try and play this mix uh, in the car, in your friend's house, or perhaps even worse, you take this track to your DJ gig and it just sounds horrible, the bass is so muddy and you feel lost, overwhelmed and frustrated because you thought that the bass sounded good, but it turned out the bass didn't sound good, right? If you can relate to this, in this video, I'm gonna share with you my three-step formula that I call the Saab Harmony Method. And this method will allow you to get clean, powerful, punchy sounding kick in the bass on any system. Yes, you heard me right. Your tracks will translate to any system that you can imagine, including big club speakers and so on. If you're interested in coaching and you need help with your music, whether it's mixing, mastering, sound design, composition, and arrangement, uh, there's a link down below. You can book a call with me right away, or you can send me a message on Instagram if you want to know more about my one-on-one -on -one coaching program. And for that, for the talking, let's get straight into the video. As usual, let's open my beautiful presentation and talk about the Saab Harmony Method, how to get a clean and powerful low end. So step number one that I want to talk about is your kick and the bass combination. And this is so crucial, yet a lot of people just forget about that. So kick and the bass are the foundations of an electronic track, whether you make techno, uh, drum and bass, bass house, whatever is the genre that you produce. Selecting a perfect kick and bass combination is crucial. Like this is the key, no processing, nothing else uh, rather than sample and like kick and bass selection can make your track sound good. So this is the core. So keep that in mind. Bad kick and bass balance will ruin your track. And this is what I experienced personally. Uh, once I played some of my tracks in the club, um, and then other tracks just sounded good and the other ones just sounded horrible. So I didn't know what was the issue. So if you can get your kick in the bass right, making the rest of the track will be much easier. And then uh, this picture is like a representation of the foundation, right? So the kick and the bass uh, are the foundation of the track. So if you mess it up, everything else will just fall apart. It's just not gonna work. So what makes a good kick and the bass. I'm going to be giving you examples in Ableton and let's start with the thing number one. So timing and this is something that a lot of people get wrong. So they either make the kick uh, too long uh, or the bass too long. So both the elements are too long. Maybe one of the elements uh, is too short. So it's about having the right length. Uh, sort of the perfect length for your kick in the bass, right? So you can partially fix this with the side chain compression, right? So once you duck uh, the bass, you're gonna feel like, oh, maybe maybe it sounds good, but in reality, it will not fix the fundamental problem. So too long uh, kick in the bass will cause problems. And most importantly, it won't be translated well on a big system. So make sure you pick your kick and the bass accordingly to that. So now let's jump to Ableton and I'm gonna show you uh, what and how it actually works. So we have this uh, bass line, right? Which sounds like this. So right now the kick is just about the right length, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the length of the kick like a lot. So even though that you may feel that the kick is sounding good, it's way too long and it just it just kills the space, it occupies the space that we need for the bass line. So once we listen to the sub, we can't hear the kick hit and the sound of the bass properly, right? What is happening right now is it sort of sounds like a rumble, but once we go back and we shorten the kick, now we can hear the kick, like the thump, the hit of the kick really well, and the bass line. So this is why it's really, really crucial. It's really, really important to get your kick and a uh, bass length right. And the same problem, the same thing is going to happen if you have like too long of a release for your bass line, right? If I do like... Now it just sounds like a huge mess, right? So this is very, very important. Uh, when I say timing, what I mean here is make sure that you tune the envelope for your bass line and you pick the right length for the kick. So it's just really simple. You just have to listen uh, as I did. 
uh, just to illustrate what I mean by timing, this is going to be the next thing, is you want to generally have space in between your kick hits. Otherwise, what's going to happen is we're just not going to have uh, enough space for the subwoofer to sort of bounce back, right? So it goes back and forth, back and forth. And if you can see here, if we just don't have enough space between elements, if it's like kicking the bass constantly playing at the same volume, we're not going to have enough dynamics to, to, for the subwoofer to, to move back and forth, to bounce, right? So it will be overloaded, and I tested that personally. So you can do the same experiment, right? So uh, let me try... And again, I'm gonna make the kick a bit longer. Let's say like really, really long. And now I'm going to use a studio emulation software and I'm gonna use a club uh, emulation. So just listen to how the kick and the bass sounds here. It's just overloaded, right? just not good but once I go back I fix the length of my kick now I can hear both the kick and the bass well so this is why it's really really important so keep that in mind okay now the next thing when it comes to kick and the bass combination is going to be the kick and the bass tone so one of the big 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 problems why a lot of my tracks sounded bad on the big system in the club was the result of having wrong kick and bass combination and we're going to talk about that in a lot of details so i was curious why some of my tracks sounded pretty good and some sounded like crap <laughs> uh, there was one thing that changed everything for me we're going to talk about that the physics of sound so the problem that a lot a lot i would say like nine 99 of music producers face is um when we are making music at home we often want to have more bass and we forget about the low mids and this is really important so as you can see on the picture this is the area where the most problems come from so most of the times when making music at home we feel uh, like we don't have enough bass right so we want to focus on this area add more of the sub but the problem is that we forget about the low mids where the clarity where the punch of the kick comes from so let me just give you another example uh i have created another kick sound which is lower in the register so it has that nice sub and you may feel like it it sounds okay right so let me test so you're like nice and uh powerful like the sub kick you know so you feel like oh like this is exactly what i need right so once i play with the bass line yeah so we have this low end right and it may even feel like, yeah, it's sort of okay, right? But once we play that uh, in a club, so let's assume that like we play it in the club now. Now you can feel the same problem. It just kills. It just kills the, the bass, right? But if I listen to my previous kick, has enough of that punch just the right amount but with the second one it's too sub focused it's too low and to give you even a better representation let's pitch it down even more right so if I disable that in the headphones it sounds all right but the problem is we we just don't hear the right uh, the right perspective that's oh wait that, that, that was a bit too much but you should get the point now, right? So make sure that you have enough punch for your kick, because this is, again, often something that we forget about. So if you balance this area well, your mix will be clean, right? The mids, the clarity is in the mid range. So now what we want to do is, again, I just wanna sort of show you uh, the two kicks uh, and one kick, as you just heard, one kick was way too low. It didn't have enough of the punch. So the problem with that, it may seem okay on headphones, but for smaller systems, it will be impossible to play those frequencies. And there's another example that I'm going to play for you, is this is the second kick. And the main harmonic on this kick is around 105 
hertz. And this is the punch that we need here, right? So just to show you, uh, again, this is going to be the third kick. This is not the perfect kick for this track, but it uh, illustrates the concept really well. Right, so if we play this one with the bass. And maybe let's disable saturation. Maybe we can make it a bit quieter. And then we can make the whole kick a bit shorter. And then cut a little bit of the high end here. So this kick, even though it's not perfect, when we play it uh, with the... At least you can hear the bass still. But the key here is um, making your own kicks. So this is something that I I now do a lot because it just gives you way more control uh, rather than using like a sample. I just don't have such flexible controls as I can do. And then again, let me play for you the perfect kick. So this is the one that I made specifically for the shack. And with the club emulation, this is the key. So if you can get the right sounding kick that goes well with the bass, this is like 50% done <laughs> with the track. So you can be sure that for the most of it, you did the right thing, okay? So this, this is the problem. If your kick doesn't have enough of the uh, low mids or like the mid harmonics, it's just not going to be translated well on a big system, right? So how do I know if my kick is good? So you want your main subharmonic to be around 60 hertz. And let's say I'm going to analyze this kick, this one. So as you can see, the main thing is happening here. So it's not like it has to be exactly 60. What you want to, to have in your kick, just enough of that mid punch, because if we don't have enough of that, the kick is just not going to sound good, right? So the punch, the punch is here. So this is, uh, these are the frequencies that a lot, like pretty much all of the systems can play. So this is why we need to focus on that. So make sure you also have enough punch in the low mid, as I told you. So from 60 to like one, 120, 150, something, something like that. And what is really, really important, the kick sounds great with the bass with almost no processing. This is really the key, right? So you want to make sure that the kick just from the beginning sounds great with your uh, with your bass line, excuse me. If you can get this right, then with the processing, you can take it to the next level. But if you're gonna try to fix that with the processing, you're just basically shooting yourself in the foot. And then there's the next thing and really important concept that we have to talk about. Uh, there should be an optimal amount of tension between your kick and the bass. And I'm gonna show you what I mean here. So let's talk about tension. If you ever heard a good track on a good system, like in a good club, you know how punchy, how how pleasant it is to hear those bass frequencies. So you know like uh, the sound of the kick, you know the sound of the bass, and it's just enough tension. It's not too little, it's not too much, right? So you want to achieve a bouncy effect when the kick hits. It shouldn't drag you down, it shouldn't kill the vibe, it should sort of make you want to move to the beat. This is the key with uh, selecting the perfect um, kick. Uh, for your baseline, for your track. So the key again is achieving just enough tension. Having too much or too little will ruin your mix. So again, what is really, really important is to think of the kick and the bass as a mechanism, as a car, like whatever analogy you want to use. It should be like as one thing. So the groove should be seamless. So if you have any problems with tension, maybe the kick is too loose, maybe it's too tight, you know, something is off. What you can try is changing the tempo and the key of the track uh, for a better low end. So if you hear to the, uh, if you hear the original track, like the original demo, like it's felt pretty nice. But uh, in the second version, I decided to change the key of the track and I decided to put it one semitone down just to get the right amount of tension for my kick and the bass. So just, just to give you a quick example how that could sound. This is just the right amount of tension because F sharp, 
I want to go down a little bit. We'll talk about changing the key a bit later, but I'm just giving you this tip already, right? And then I changed the whole arrangement. So the track is now in F and I like it way more. So it gives me just the right amount of tension. So now I can hear the punch of the kick, I can hear the bass, everything is sounding really, really well. And again, let's compare that to the previous one. It's not like it's bad, but uh, putting the track back, like one semitone down to F, is just something that made the bass groove so much better for me, right? Just the right amount. So you can try, you can try it out, okay? So, now let's talk about the tension uh, in uh, a bit more detail. So what I want to do now is to uh, give you another example. So let's put the kick in the bass here. And I'm going to solo the kick in the bass. And now we're going to play with a different amount of tension. So basically the tension is how fast the kick goes from its highest point to the lowest point. So here we have just the right amount of tension. If I put my kick a bit down, this is not enough tension. Oh wait, excuse me. That was a little bit too much. So if we test the track like this, it may seem like it's okay. But even just like this, you can hear the kick is like too muffled, it's too soft, it doesn't have enough of that punch. And if we, if we take a look at the, um, at the equalizer here, even though that it looks like we have our main harmonic at 70, it's still like the kick is just not like bouncy enough. But once we go back, this is just the right amount of punch that we need. So when I say tension, I hope that you understand what I mean now. So even if you don't have this plugin, still the same concept applies. So what you can do, if you have like a low kick, you can change it to a more like high pitch kick, or maybe you want to do the other way around because you either have like the baseline, which is a little bit higher, or you have the kick, which is a little bit more uh, powerful, right? So there's always one element which is going to have more power. It's either kick or either the baseline. Uh, in, in this in this case, I decided to make the kick like really punchy, really mid-focused. But then again, if I make it too... This is just not enough tension. This is what, I, what I'm talking about. So having this right amount of tension is really, really the key. So experiment uh, with that. And then again, just to give you uh, another example, this is the kick, right? So we can... This one is pretty low. This may seem like... So this one is not really like punchy. Not like as, as punchy as the kick that I have, right? It's it's still manageable. You can still use that as a kick in the mix, but then again, it's really going to depend on the baseline. So uh, keep that in mind when you're gonna be selecting the kick for your track, okay? So uh, now, the second thing which is really really important is going to be the rhythm and the groove so the right groove is what is going to make your track feel alive this is something that makes you want to move right so once you hear a good track you're just like oh like i want to dance to the beat so you want to achieve seamless and confident kick in the bass groove so this is the foundation of the track and just to give you an example about the groove you can have sort of good notes and bad groove that's not going to work because it's just like not danceable but you can have a great groove and bad notes and it's still going to be danceable so uh, this thing can be quite subjective i gotta be honest with you so if we go back to the track here uh can be quite subjective right so i'm gonna give you this example so this is the the original groove right so this is what we Uh, let me play the piano for you here, like this. So the groove is a combination of different note lengths. It's a combination of uh, pauses and things like that. So I just want you to 
uh, pay attention how the groove and the feeling of the track changes once I change the melody. So if you have problems with the groove, you may want to check the melody. Like maybe something's wrong with the melody. Maybe I need to use different rhythm, right? So again, like same track, different bass line. It's going to give you like a completely different feel. So in this case, I don't feel this bass line is really working with my piano. However, if I solo like the kick and, and the bass, overall the bass line is really groovy, right? It's really nice, like it makes me want to dance. But the problem that you might have is the bass line melody and the melody of your uh, instruments just doesn't go that well. So what you want to always test is the melody, the groove. Do I need to change the rhythm? Do I need to tweak my melody? Maybe I need to do more variation as I do here, right? So having different octaves, this is all about the groove. So this thing is quite subjective and I think I'm gonna make like a separate video about the groove and how um, you can work with that in music. But overall, uh, this is sort of the tip, right? Now let's talk about how to make good bass grooves and I have five examples for you here. So uh, the first thing that is sort of quite obvious is having different note links, right? So you can see here, I have different note links. Some of them are, are pretty long and some of them are pretty short. And just by having different dynamics, this is something that is going to make your tracks like way more interesting, way more professional. So uh, let's go back. So not all of the notes are the same because if I would have had like the same notes, it would be just like really, really boring. So let me just give you this example. All the notes are going to be much, much longer. And that's just gonna feel like really, really boring, right? Check it out. So just something that came to my mind, I could do like a little variation like this. And maybe this one could be a little bit shorter. So just by using different note link alone, this can take your tracks to the next level. Just this thing alone, like can improve your mixes a lot. That's one of the things. Uh, the next thing is going to be the velocity. So in different synthesizers, you can um, use velocity to control the uh, uh, filter uh, of the synthesizer. So for example, the velocity, if I increase it, uh, let me play that for you. If I do the other way. Just by changing the velocity. Even even that could be like, you know, pretty good. sounds kind of weird, but I hope that, that you get the point. So just by adjusting velocity to different synth parameters, again, this will improve your groove by like five, ten percent But the more things like that you do to the mix, the better it will sound. Okay, so this is again, one of the really, really cool things that you can do to your tracks, uh, automation. So yeah, this is quite sort of like a basic stuff, but a lot of, a lot of people forget about that. So with automation again, We can make the baseline feel more alive. So this is also really, really important. Uh, one more thing that, again, I haven't seen a lot of people doing that is going to be the groove pool. So in the groove pool, you can, as you can see, let's go to the uh, groove library here. And then you can use those different grooves and apply the groove to the, to the baseline. So let me, for example, Let's use this one as an example, right? So I'm going to, to use like 60, 60, maybe three here and three here. And then we are going to select it like this. And then we're going to So what this does, it creates micro pauses 
and it humanizes your baseline. So just by trying out different grooves, again, this thing can make your baselines feel more alive. So this is something worth mentioning. Uh, so make sure you try out different groups. Uh, and the last thing is going to be the delay shift. So what I noticed, and this is the tip that I learned from another producer is uh, if you utilize a little bit of uh, micro delay shifts, this can give you a little bit of that extra space for the baseline. So for example, if I uh, use 10 milliseconds delay here, this is without, and I think the sweet spot would be like six. It's a pretty subtle thing, but try it out. Maybe for your track, it's going to make uh, quite a big of a difference. Okay, so those are five tips for making better uh, bass groups. And now these are another five tips that you can use. So uh, as we spoke earlier, uh, try different notes or rhythm. Oftentimes, uh, playing with notes and the rhythm can really take your track uh, to the next level just by changing the key. Like, trust me, just try it out. Then the next tip is, is again, changing the key of the, or the tempo of the track. Uh, change your kick in the bass timbre. Uh, you can change also the kick in the bass length and you can change the bass filter envelope. So I want, you, I want you to look at everything like a puzzle. So timing, timbre, key and tempo, notes and rhythm. This is a part of like one big picture. Right, so those are five ultimate things that you can do in case your uh, baseline, in case your low end, low end is just not working as good as you expect, expect it to work, right? So for example, what if we make this track like 125? And let's play that. Because the original track was 124 and I decided to change it to 121 because for me that was really the perfect tempo, the perfect key. And then again, as you saw in this example, I changed the key of the track and maybe I want to go to, hmm, I'm just thinking, let's say we do D sharp, right? And let me play for you D sharp and that's going to change the vibe of the track as well, right? So let me play that for you. You know, it's... the vibe changes, everything changes when you change the key uh, of the track and the tempo as well. So now step number three, which is going to be processing. So when it comes to the processing, uh, processing is basically a tool that will help you to sculpt uh, the sound, like the final sound of your kick in the bass. What we're going to be focusing on uh, on a lot is going to be saturation because this is the game changer. So the right processing is the difference between amateur and pro sounds that translates to big audio systems. And I'm going to show you uh, the key to processing. So one more thing is group processing is what's going to change your mixes forever. So trust me. How do you process your kick in the bass? This is sort of the representation uh, of the processing chain. So for the kick, it's usually a bit of EQ, saturation, then compression. So right now, I don't process my kicks that much. For the bass, a little bit more complicated. So EQ, sidechain, saturation, a bit of limiting and compression. We're gonna talk about that just in a second. And what you, I want you to get with processing is that less is more. So try to get the right sound without a lot of processing because otherwise you may kill the um, dynamics, for example. You may overcompress, you may like saturate too much. So try to get it with less processing and then uh, if you need more, just add that. How do we use saturation? So I just want to quickly show you the uh, uh, kick and the bass sound uh, without saturation here so let's go back to the key and then i'm gonna play for you this is the same track but without saturation so for example the kick is pretty nice right and let me disable saturation here so it's still like pretty nice 
but it's lacking that power, it's lacking that glue. So with saturation, let's go back to the presentation, you want to pay attention to multiband saturation because this will help you to, uh, sorry, not shear, but shape the sound exactly as you want. For example, if your bass needs more low mids, you can add that. If your lead needs more high end, you can add that. And you can use saturation as a shaping or sound design tool pretty much, right? This is a quick tip for gluing your kick in the bass. And let me show you that in action. So uh, what I did to the kick in the bass here, first thing that I did was I wanted to add a little bit of crunch to my bass line. So I did that with a broken tube algorithm. I'm not gonna go like too deep into the algorithms, just test different algorithms to see which one would sound best on your bass line. So here, I wanted to add more uh, of the low mids and the mids. So it made my bass like feel a little bit brighter. And then I think it would also make sense to to add a bit more bass here. Something like that. So what this gives us is more harmonics in the in the mids, like this. So if you listen to the bass line. You can see those harmonics, right? But without saturation, like even just by listening to the sound, like it feels way weaker, like not as full, not as uh, powerful, right? So with saturation here, what we are doing, we can work independently with each of the bands. And then uh, also make sure that you utilize the equalizer function because this will help you to shape the sound even more, okay? So, uh, now let me show you what we can do on the group because on the group this is going to be the magic that you can see with saturation so uh, take a look at the processing what i did here i split uh, the whole group into two bands i'm using that not like it's like 100 percent but about like 50 70 maybe like 25 you can play with that and then take a look i'm also utilizing the equalizer here because it changes the sound and uh, this is what we got so far. So from this, we got, so it glued the sound. And then if you need more additional control, you can do the same thing on the kick, right? So you can take a look at the kick and maybe if you need a bit of uh, extra low end, then maybe you're just going to mute this part, right? And then you just want to focus on the low mids. And let's say I'm gonna do like, I'm obviously ex exaggerating a bit and this is like too much uh, on the kick, but I hope you get the point with, with saturation. So. Uh, it would be hard to explain like everything in one video, but this is the approach that you can use, right? So, so the key with saturation, why we are doing that in the first place is that it's going to help us saturate the mids. And in the mids, as I told you earlier, the clarity is in the mids. If we can get uh, the mids, I mean like the balance for the mids, if we can have enough of harmonics in the mids, the mix is going to be translated on like any system. That's, that's the thing. So this is why we are doing saturation in the first place. And step number four, and this is going to be the last step, this is something that is going, going to give you like a true perspective is going to be uh, referencing. So let's talk about that. Having a well-mixed reference track is the key to maintaining the true perspective on your mix. The reason why you struggle, and what I was struggling to get the right balance is the lack of proper monitoring, just because you don't hear things the right way, you can't test. So have two, three reference tracks in your session when you produce. This will help you to keep your ears fresh. How do you reference in the right way? So you want to pick the tracks in the same key and uh, in the same tempo. So this is a diagram that represents the same key and the same tempo. So the tracks should be similar, even if it's, uh, like this is still okay. Uh, 
So the track should be similar in your style with uh, similar sounds. Then you want to compare the reference and your tracks face to face. So again, if you have like a dubstep track and you reference that with house track, it's not gonna make a lot of sense, right? So this is why it's really, really important to reference. Uh, how do you reference? So let's say that you have uh, picked uh, the track and then what you want to do is in Ableton, you want to uh, do like this. So on this one, I don't know like what's the name for this, but you want to click extend it out. So that's why the track is not being affected by the processing that you have on your master channel, right? So once you do that, you want to make sure that the loudness is the same. So just use any loudness meter. So in this case, it's going to be, so let's do the beat. Actually, I think this, this is not really, um, okay, let, let, let's skip that. Basically, what you want to pay attention to uh, is going to be the, the RMS, sort of like the medium, the medium loudness. So like, not the peak, as you can see, right? Which is roughly at minus 12. You want to make sure that the, the bright green thing here is the same as the track that we are listening to. So if I were to reference those two, I would do it something like, like this, right? And then I would, let's say, ah, uh, maybe we need, So now those two tracks are the same. They have the same loudness. She's a freak, freak. Ah. Yeah, uh, that, that, was a bit, <laughs> that was a bit off because I took uh, different parts of the track, but again, uh, just make sure that you have the same loudness uh, for your tracks. Uh, what else can we talk about when it comes to you? Uh, referencing. So let me go back to my presentation. Um, that was sort of pretty much it. Uh, the last thing that I want to wrap up this video with is referencing technique. So you, uh, I think you saw how I uh, cut the stereo uh, excuse me, not the stereo, but the sub frequencies on uh, on my master channel. So I just soloed the, the bass frequencies. And what this why this is super helpful is because it gives you uh, a perspective just on the bass alone. So you are able to focus on the sub frequencies. So that's why you can test your mixes face to face against reference tracks. So it really, it's like really punchy. On the other hand, if I do the same thing on this track, right, let me play this one. Like the bass is not as prominent, it's not as pronounced, and it's not as clean. So by referencing uh, your tracks to reference tracks like face to face, this is something that will help you to get the right balance. So this one is quite... And then if I listen to my track, I can for sure hear that I have the thumb, like the head of the kit. So this is one of the techniques that you can do. So simply uh, put your uh, put a filter on the master channel and then just solo. You can you can go really low. Even if I go low like this, you can hear still like hear the uh, sound of my kick and the bass. So this is really helpful. And one more thing that will be really, really helpful as well is if you use any uh, studio emulation software. So uh, this is something that I use a lot now. Uh, a little bit too much. So this is helpful because it can emulate different uh, systems, right? So I can listen in the car. Sounds amazing, like really clean in terms of the kick and the bass. Right, and then you can test different systems and this will give you a lot, a lot of different perspectives on your mix, right? 
So again, just the, the final thing we can do, uh, is say like Real Studio. Sounds pretty good. And once you do that to the reference tracks and you compare your tracks to the reference ones like face to face, then it will give you the right perspective on things and how you can mix uh, low end for your tracks. So yeah, that was a pretty long tutorial, but I hope that you learned something new in this video. So this is something that I've been learning recently and I wanted to share some of my uh, newest discoveries, like newest ideas, newest concepts that I heard. So you can use that uh, in your own tracks. So that was it for this video. I appreciate you watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, uh, leave a comment if you're enjoying my channel, uh, if you're enjoying the videos, and I see you guys in the next one.